odpoledne, dámy a pánové. Je mi ctí, že vás mohu provést dnešní závěrečnou debatou. Well, I would like uh, to now open the last part of our today's debate or panel, which is called the Millennium and the Future of the EU, which is, of course, essential. Who is going to lead the Europe? or EU, it'll be the uh, current and future generations. That is why we have to take them into an account. What will the future be of the EU through the perspectives of, of our today's guest? I have the privilege to welcome Kovi, the YouTuber. Then then Jaroslav Miller, Palacki University in Olomouc. Good afternoon to you. Also the finalist in the essay contest of Asav Havel Library, Barbara Kolarova. Good afternoon. And in order to have a, the broadest, so to say, variety of views, we also have Wojciech Dick, the singer and actor here with us. So, my name is Susanna Tvarushkova. I'm the moderator of Czech TV, but not always do I have such a broad variety of uh, speakers here or panelists, so thank you for coming here. And the first question, and I'm not going to uh, skip you, Mr. Miller. Uh, but now that you hear all over the place the kind of perspective of the f future EU and how important or that this uh, MEP election is perhaps the most important, do you think it's real it or is it just a part and parcel of media pressure? What do you think? How should we approach the elections and uh, uh, then what will the future of the EU be like, I wonder? Well, I, be I believe it's the very contrary. I think that the media pressure is not as uh, strong as it should be. That's my view, by the way. Because, um, you know, the turnout has always been very low. And that is why the elections should be far more promoted or advertised. People don't realize that means the general public how significant it is. But we have some anti, um, so to say, European parties in power. On the other hand, they might, if they win, uh, use this as a dictate or what, or claiming that to be a dictate. Simply, I don't know how to approach it. But I guess that the interest in the election into the European Parliament should be enhanced. I don't feel any major interest in this election amongst the people around me. That's because most young people don't really know what uh, uh, it is all about. You know, they are not uh, enough uh, informed. And they believe that European Union is some, so to say, far away or remote political giant uh, that uh, dictates, etc. And this uh, kind of language um, which has been presented uh, here, which is used in our country, doesn't help it. If you take the copyright directive, well, that's perhaps some the piece of legislation that might have brought many young people uh, towards the European Union and that might have presented or introduced the European Union setting or concept as such. But I don't see much of an interest, to be quite frank, in the elections. Well, you know what? I, I have mixed feelings. If... Uh, I'm to take the number of campaigns Paints or crews that have um, asked me to, in one way or another, support the uh, elections. Well, that was the largest number, the highest number so far, which is a surprise because last time nobody, nobody actually approached me asking me to support that. But now I know four or five. I mean, strangers as well as uh, friends asked me or approached me. But 
to be able to say that in the bubble around me we chat about the European Parliament elections. Well, not, that's not the case. Uh, what will your decision be based on whom to elect? Will you tell us you want? No, I want. I'm, I'm reluctant. It's a very challenging decision to be made because I, I think being an artist, if I may call myself an artist, uh, it is my task or role to put up the mirror to the others or which is why I uh, hardly ever or never say whom I support. And if anyone, then a presidential candidate, yes, because I knew the situation was really uh, dreadful. But now it's difficult to choose. Uh, what's d difficult, to choose someone or to be or not to be simply kind of uh, defeated or, I mean, what, what or, well, but that would, it's simply difficult to decide, but then we would have to get immersed in philosophical debate. Uh, we have uh, more questions, obviously, questions coming up. If someone wants to um, take the mic and share with us, she is more than welcome. So. I will follow from um, what you have said. We know that uh, many, um, not many people go to the elections and the turnout is really low. How come? What should we do to change that? And perhaps uh, then Mr. Miller might join us. But first, you, that is a young generation rep. Do you know why they don't turn out? Are they interested? Don't they consider it relevant? Don't they hear about it at schools? They believe it doesn't concern them simply. They believe it's um, all outside our country, all the institutions of the EU. And I believe that also they don't, uh, the young people don't uh, take any interest in getting involved. And I'm not saying that uh, all of them are indifferent, but many of them are. It, they just believe it's too, too far away. So the municipal election, they approach differently. There the turnout is pretty high, but that does not apply to the European elections, or European Parliament elections. Simply, I believe it's because they don't realize uh, its importance. Now, Mr. Miller, you should uh, tell us something about the changing behavior, if there is any change, if you take different generations approach to the elections and if you take commitment. You believe, uh, I guess you have the gut feeling that I'm not a millennial. I'm not a millennial either, by the way. Uh, well, I've just thought of the wonderful Monty Python, Brian's life scene, where, which one, where the Brits, uh, uh, I mean, complain about all the ill doings of Roman Empire that had caused, uh, that had been, um, I mean, inflicted on them, civilization, sewerage, and God knows what, or roads. I have the honor. Uh, to be at one of the major universities. We are often criticized for being far too activists. We simply go to villages or municipalities and discuss topical issues with uh, the population, with the inhabitants. It, the chats or discussions usually take place in pubs. Uh, you have two different groups. First are those in their 50s, 60s, the angry men. And the second group is the Z or um, generation of the millennials. And while the first, uh, the elderly and angry group, doesn't really know what to think about the European Union, they have, they are confused a bit, and uh, well, that's this one group, and the other one, the uh, group of those born in the mid uh, eighties or later, uh, they they have a much clear a much clearer idea about it. They are ready to go to the elections, and they also are clear about their expectations from the Union, European Union. They are the first generation uh, 
that is well aware of uh, transnational challenges, global warming, climate change. Well, it's not national. It's all transnational or multinational uh, problem, which requires a cooperation of multiple states. And the European Union, in their lives, will play an um, essential role. Well, I believe we have got quite a representative sample of people, of panelists, I mean. But let's say that at the university, if you follow monitor the interest in uh, public activities or developments, can you see any difference in mindset or approach of uh, people? I mean, the young generation is well aware about the importance of this election, and yet the turnout is very low. Always. So, what is this caused by? I suggest that we wait and see for the end of this week. So, you feel some sort of hope, or but yeah, I'm ready to bet. I mean, to put at stake something dear to me, and I'm reluctant to share with you what it might be. I believe that the turnout will be higher than before since we have many political groupings which uh, are the platform for young people like the Pirates or the Green parties. And these types of parties will be more successful than they expect, I believe. And uh, these um, type of parties will attract many young people to the election um, sort of earned. So I'm an acad member of academia. I'm a bit horrified seeing uh, that I'm the oldest member of the panel, so I can do nothing else but share theory with you. But I believe that to a major degree, this is a matter of identity. And the pubs, when talking to people, we often hear the argument that the European Union suppresses the national spirit, or that simply, uh, which is a funny argument because, you know, the nation hasn't existed in those days of um, Father Czech or what. If you try, uh, ask a farmer of uh, simply what they invented, what they didn't invent, and think they had different identity. And, a nation as such has been formed artificially. The, the opinion of Generation Z will talk about the national identity being transformed into transnational because it is not a natural identity or a naturally developed or formed um, category, so to say, or better to say. I believe the turnout simply will be higher. I do not want to flood you with my personal sort of narratives or stories in Cuba. I met, I don't know, a group of 16, 17-year-old French um, youngsters. I ask, how come uh, you are not here with the families or siblings? I ask whether they came from Paris. And, um, yes, and I'm born Parisian, so they look at me kind of flabbergasted saying well or thinking what does she want for heaven's sake I'm, I come from France or from Paris and that's it I just come from this world and that's it they had no special pride in being per from Paris and they said they didn't even want to be felt like that or taken like that how about you you studied abroad <laughs> Well, I was to France uh, for two shorter states, but you you were studying abroad. Yes, yes, I, I was. Well, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, the project that I was involved in uh, comprised a number of uh, foreign nationals, um, and uh, the differences that I noticed there were rather uh, remarkable. They were clearly seen. Um, there were also biases there about certain nationalities, etc. But uh, if I were there uh, longer uh, and uh, on my own without uh, other Czech people, probably the community would be um, more similar to what you have just described. I wouldn't say that I would... Uh, uh, I would... Uh, 
uh, see uh, differences of uh, between the nationalities. Uh, and when you talk about the national identity level, of, is it necessary to stress uh, who belongs uh, where at present time? I don't think that it's so important. Um, I uh, think about this issue quite often. And uh, basically, it's 50 to 50, whether I should uh, say that I am a European or I am a Czech. Uh, uh, it's not uh, very clear to me yet. And I also think that uh, we cannot uh, oppose these two terms, that it, they may be presented sim um, jointly. Gentlemen, what about you? Do you think who you are? Uh, my last video starts uh, with the phrase, we are citizens of the European Union. And already uh, it evoked certain controversies. Uh, I can say clearly that I am a European because I went to America, Africa, other countries, and I've seen a number of uh, other cultures. And uh, uh, Europe, the European Union, um, holds a lot of uh, common features, uh, not similar features. But uh, I don't think that we should somehow deny the national identity. It will stay. And if the uh, tendencies are too strong, uh, it may result in something unwanted uh, to some nationalistic tendencies uh, that uh, so you want to do uh, something that we are against. Uh, on my own behalf, I have to say that uh, uh, in recent times, I realize I am a, I am a human being, regardless uh, uh, whether I am in Latin America or in other parts of the world, uh, um, because uh, everywhere the situations are similar or the same. I do not distinguish. I don't mind where I am, who I am. Currently, as you told about the generational differences, the millennials, I'm also one of them, uh, you are old millennial. Uh, I, so there are young millennials and old millennials. OK. Well, OK. Hussak's child, Hussak's generation child, as we call you. Thank you. Uh, you should probably see it from archives, records. Well, I think that the approach to the EU is undergoing a change. And I think that uh, uh, this is probably also the reason why many people uh, abstaining from this, uh, these elections, uh, that uh, we are threatened by this being a certain institution that we cannot change it, and that's, uh, the, that's the fact that, and for instance, me, my generation, we uh, lived in a space without borders, and I therefore do not see it as something uh, that I cannot reach. Uh, something that I cannot uh, influence. Uh, I perceive it as a certain dialogue that uh, is started within my family and uh, then extending it up to the European Union and uh, up to the global terms. Uh, the form of uh, uh, or the shape of European Union will depend on us, on our behavior, on our talks, uh, uh, how we discuss it with Mr. Miller, whether we uh, present a good argument and whether, whether or not we are able to reach a consensus. This may be the main reason for why many people still do not want to participate uh, in this election because uh, they have their experiences. Uh, this, uh, They know the mayor of, of their town or village, and uh, it's a much shorter relationship. It, it is rather strong for me if I see billboards everywhere, billboards presenting uh, uh, different parties as movement. Many of them, there's something that we call TD. That's uh, a special term of the young generation. 
Well, what I want to say is uh, that uh, um, we have a question to this. Uh, are the young people influenced by the older generation or they just uh, look for information on the Internet uh, and, uh, and uh, social media? Uh, I would like to know how the uh, the two generation may understand each other. Obviously, politicians uh, try to bring the two generation together via various campaigns. Uh, to, uh, they try to approximate the two generation, and as the time goes on, uh, the development is much faster. Does this become uh, even more difficult? Perhaps uh, I can present just my uh, individual e experience. I. Uh, very often discuss with my father about Europe, about uh, the European Union, and uh, very often uh, it's really tough. My father uh, reads a lot, really a lot, uh, but he's from the generation uh, who remembers uh, revival times in this country, so to say. He's thinking very carefully about the world. And he's 70, and uh, he's not able to uh, uh, surpass the national identity barrier. It's maybe due to some generational mentality, not his fault as such. Uh, while me, I come from uh, a generation who was uh, 18 when the Velvet de Revolution started, Europe got open, and all of a sudden we had the opportunity that we never dreamt of. And uh, if something changes, so you put your biases uh, aside. Sometimes you can see it uh, uh, in other countries. Uh, uh, if you travel to abroad, um, you can see that people there tackle similar problems or the same problems. And this is a piece of experience that uh, you cannot uh, transpose to somebody else. Uh, you have to live it. A certain generational gap uh, is perhaps there, is existing here, but it's due to my personal experiences. Uh, well, the politicians, uh, claim something, uh, they usually are from the uh, older generation. Do you trust them? Do you believe what they say, what they claim just in this pre-election time? For instance, um, uh, the last panel, someone said that we should talk together. Uh, you see, I'm always a bit unhappy. Uh, in uh, the times uh, of elections when someone tells me, uh, well, I won't talk to him anymore because he uh, opted for another party. And uh, I think that a number of uh, young people uh, vote for a movement or party which is not systemic. Uh, and uh, this may be due to the fact that these people sometimes were disappointed or several times were disappointed uh, with the outcomes. Uh, and that's why today they opt for something else. Uh, and uh, they go even to, to the extremes. Uh, and I had to explain my grandma quite long that uh, one of the particular program uh, presents very bad family relations and that I had to explain her that it's not real, that it's just uh, acting. Uh, well, what I want to say is that uh, you should communicate across all the generations. Uh, I don't want to use bon mot. Uh, we have other people for, for those uh, in this country, um, perhaps even better than mine. But let me respond at least partially. Uh, if you take the title of the first panel, so it was quite interesting, matter or love or marriage of convenience. Well, I would opt for the latter. Sometimes we uh, gain more than we give. Uh, while in the case of uh, young generation that I meet uh, at the university, uh, I would say that uh, it's more a matter of love uh, to be in the EU. But my feelings are mixed. Uh, 
because as a historian, I know that uh, marriage of convenience uh, stands longer than uh, marriage of love. <laughs> well, it may be a completely different topic, uh, but statistics are clear. But these are ones and zeros. Where is the poetry in it? Uh, well, you were not convinced that you should not be connected with the politics. Today, we have heard uh, Ms. Jorova, the European Commissioner. And you see, I have bad experience uh, from meeting politicians, uh, and I never supported a political party. And I don't think that it is uh, good if uh, this is uh, done by uh, an Austin. I had a bad experience with a certain person, uh, and since that time, I think that's wrong. Uh, I don't want to force an, an opinion upon you, but uh, this is how I feel it and uh, how I act. But my father is uh, an educated person, too. Maybe we have the same father, but we will see. Uh, he was born in 1928, and the stimuli towards saying something are very broad. Because if you uh, lived uh, the First or Second World War, and you could lose your life, so it may uh, give you completely different, totally different priorities. Uh, your life will change. And uh, this is why we cannot uh, uh, get to an agreement on a joint, the same candidate. Uh, at a certain moment, I realized uh, that either I will oppose him all the times, uh, or, or, and even if he is 91, uh, I will not be able to enjoy this relationship, or I will accept his different opinion, and I uh, simply will take it. I don't know whether we are actually able to behave in this way. For me, perhaps, yes, but uh, I don't know whether the majority society is able to behave in this way. And uh, let me link in, link in to what you said. I distinguish between a clever person and uh, wise person. And uh, the latter ones are mainly needed. Yes, because they may be too smart, uh, the, the smart ones. That's a problem. When we talked about isolation, obviously it is not only the generational matter. Uh, where isolation can happen and how to uh, uh, do away with it. Uh, you are involved in the social world, uh, internet world, etc. So I am supposed to. Uh, I don't want to be too smart. Perhaps I should be wise. Um, don't be stressed. Well, I, I feel stressed a bit after what has been said. Well, it's not about uh, looking for right recipes. Uh, uh, but you see, the world of social networks, uh, um, the, the environment per se uh, moved uh, this perception. They have uh, uh, there. Are, there are a lot of young people who have their own world, uh, and uh, two groups of people got mad uh, in this country. For instance, one group is just praising our prime minister, the other just hating it. And usually, uh, these people are quite successful. We have their berets. And this is where we have to uh, look for the answers. But we are a sort of experimental generation. We have to learn how to live, it, live this uh, situation, how to raise my children. 
Uh, and what about your kids? Uh, I have no kids yet, but it may come in the future, and I'm a bit afraid of it, because a child in the environment of social networks uh, uh, is tackled uh, by big opponents, uh, marketeers, etc., and this uh, very environment is very difficult to, to live in. The common denominator of all the gentlemen in the cabs is a sort of social pathy. Social pathology, I believe. And the only way to get rid of it or cope with it is to run away from it. But you can't do that, you know. So it's impossible, actually, to do that. To run away or escape better to say. And the other thing is that they don't use or work with emotions, and that's extremely challenging for um, an ordinary person who is used to work with emotions. So, and I am an opponent, strong opponent of social networks. I thought of setting up a social or anti-social networks uh, grouping. Perhaps it would have more users than these social network, are you bad? Yeah, many actors uh, would be there, singers, academia as well. I do hope so, for sure. But I just think that... Um Unfortunately, it is a kind of cliche, but it does truly depersonalize the world and rates of emotions. Because, you know, what you express by me, uh, smiley on an SMS, and to make uh, you laugh, or there is a longer way between, or longer difference between that. Um, we don't. We are not uh, poorly off or badly off if you compare it with my dad who had been on barricades, etc. But some sort of mental or spiritual flu, that's what the mankind suffers from now. Could you say something more about that? Well, I'll be serious for a while now. Well, this was serious as well, I believe in. Key to me is the world isolation or separation because isolation um, covers multiple things and it will depend on the future story to be written by Europe. By coincidence, I mm, attended a dinner with David Cameron, uh, with whom uh, he was my classmate. At, uh, Cambridge, uh, we were, you know, we used to be on the same rowing boat, and um, he told me, by the way, that he had no idea whatsoever what um, the people, uh, what sort of life people live outside Oxford and London. So I guess it was in Oxford. <laughs> Sorry, and. Uh, I realize that we ridicule the or make fun of the British because of Brexit, but we are exactly the same. You know, we have a couple of projects uh, during which we go to the Sudetenland, Borderland areas with our people, and we realize that people living there feel isolated, separated. But, you know, this is not um, of interest to the politicians because there is a low number of inhabitants and the turnout of these people and the elections is uh, not big either. So, um, and that is why to work with people who feel isolated, whether from the social, economic, cultural point of view, well, the cooperation or liaison with them will perhaps be the major decisive element in the future, uh, in the next 20, 30 years. Yeah, and, well, I would love to talk to Mr. Cameron as well, but I'll form the question and I'll then ask him. I saw him together with Mr. Topolanek, which was long, long before the uh, referendum. Plus, I live in Sudetenland, so I know what life uh, is like there. And we are surprised sometimes by, I mean, we are surprised, or people are surprised at a certain delay. But that is caused by the environments of uh, people in, uh, or environments in which people actually were 
brought up. And when you refer to Great Britain, tell me, what is your personal opinion on the process, which calls Brexit? No. Well, um, oh, it, now when you listen to those who criticize you, oh, when they criticize all the deeds and acts uh, committed by the evil or wicked Brussels, etc., and then you never see them doing something right at home. So I, my brother lives in London, and he... Um, it describes situations which cannot be made public or um, announced here. I mean, do you like to follow the debate on Brexit, or do you think uh, do you think it's uh, horrifying? It's interesting, but it also uh, is full of um, political responsibility matters. You know, some people uh, were or felt betrayed. What? Well, when I first uh, heard that concept of Brexit, uh, I mean, I, thanks to common sense, uh, understood, sort of understanding the British, because they contribute more than they get. Yes, so I thought it were, it made sense simply, and that it was a um, natural step they have taken. But after a couple of um, uh, later, simply, when I started to contemplate about that, I realized what a chaos it would uh, cause in the EU as a whole. Because that will er erode the trust in the EU as such and the unit and so on. And then I read some statistical returns in Google and on at obviously only after the result uh, some people learned what it was all about you know, obviously from the results it it uh, could be deduced that many British didn't know what they were making decision about you know oh, sorry it wasn't very clear David Cameron was um, kind of guitar at the beginning, which they disappear, and um, I follow it with major interest, or utmost interest, but it's a bit sad, you know, because the British always felt, so to say, superior, haughty, and all of a sudden they don't know what to do, they are confused. It's sad. That's for sure. Oh, what a lesson we could learn from that, I don't know. Many people forgot or didn't realize that it was the first and the last referendum. Simply, there is no way to repeat it. The fact that young people then uh, came to the elections and voted for laborers instead of Conservative Party, well, it's sad. It is simply sad. And it's a kind of momentum of what uh, the democracy can uh, lead to. We do elect people who have advisors or consultants who understand their respective topics better than us. I know, you know, if someone gives me a question, do you want to be in the NATO or not? Well, I don't know how I could decide about that because I have no deep or profound knowledge. To me, Brexit is yet another page of uh, the global history showing a lack of polarization of our on the contrary, sorry, suffers from a high degree of polarization. And I believe that we always try to only cure or treat the consequences rather than the cause, the uh, root cause. And 80%, zero people in the Czech Republic 
wants to be led, while I want to be responsible for myself. I, that's the way I was brought up. And also my profession, I mean, um, is fully dependent on that approach. I don't want to merely be a member of some sort of a grouping that is, I mean, instructed where to go, which way to go, etc. But it It's, you know, up to each and every individual to decide. My EU, to me, means many buts. Nevertheless, I have to ask questions. I have to put to myself the questions about those buts, you know. It's not black and white, um, simply good or bad. Yeah, but I wonder what sort of future of the EU you foresee or you, you would uh, like to see or who... Uh, cause the withdrawn approach to the union unity. EU unity. I believe that um, it's still far too fresh new, you see. So you have to get used to something. It takes more years than 15 or 30 years. We are as yet not Uh, used to functioning under this uh, grouping bearing responsibility you know for 40 years everyone was being said what to do how to do that prior to that yet another situation prevailed well we are not as yet capable of responding properly to it I wish to say that Uh, the European Union is a young uh, lad, young girl, uh, you know, the U.S. It uh, took uh, the USA to um, come into being over 100 uh, years or centuries, if you take uh, the war. And uh, she... Well, but uh, that's how the uh, European identity will take ages to be formed or to get uh, deeply rooted. Perhaps we witness some sort of Europeanization of the continent now here. Perhaps not. I don't know. Um, 15, one, five years, as Wojciech said, is nothing. May I, may I share with you, Bon Mott? This one is um, true to life. It reflects reality, really. I mean, I've got a friend who is an Italian historian, famous one, who in the late 1960s decided to explore Vatican archives and to study Inquisition protocols. At that time, it was closed to the public, so he had to ask for it by letter. This was in 68. He got no response. He got mad. He focused on some other activities. And in 84, 1984, he received an answer saying, yes, you may come and study. So it took 16 years, one thing. So he was really, I mean, terribly angry. And then he said, look, for Catholic church, Uh, with two year, thousand years of existence, what, 16 years? What does that mean? Nothing. And, you know, European project or EU project is a teenager. And it's pubescent, so the way it'll proceed throughout puberty will decide about its future. So... And now my guests um, uh, ask a question about values. It sometimes sounds very general, or, but um, when you think about it, it's far more profound. Do you think uh, values change over time, Mr. Miller? Or do you think that values as perceived by us in the European context uh, have the same meaning? Well, values change uh, over time, just like identities. You know, 100 years ago, we could have referred to Europe as Christian Europe. It was simply a part and parcel of each and every European. Now, we can't say that since it's multicultural. Europe is multicultural, multi-confessional society. Whether we like it or not, Islam belongs to Europe just like Judaistic uh, roots or roots of Judaism, etc., etc., we could. So values are not constant. They are subject to constant changes, just like the society uh, as such. It's not a holy cow. And the same uh, applies to liberal democracy. 
I mean, we've been witnessing a process of crisis of uh, representative democracy and and there are many political scientists or experts who say that the future future of Europe consists in direct democracy uh, no no we haven't heard that sorry but direct democracy, which the European society has to get used to. And it's a legitimate political opinion, by the way. And perhaps that is the real future of Europe. Who knows? I don't know. Because ever more people in Europe are frustrated they, uh, since they do elect their representatives. And then these people representing them in the parliaments do entirely different things compared to what they had expected them to do. Uh, well, uh, I don't know either what the future might be, but uh, the system of direct uh, democracy, I, I wouldn't be against it, uh, but it is very much about the level of education. And that's why I said that we have to learn it. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, people concentrate in large cities, uh, in large urban uh, entities, or uh, and the aspirations uh, go from the top. Uh, if we take the teacher salaries, so it's uh, in the lower middle part of the uh, scale. I always try to see the context uh, and uh, look or see a longer period Going back to 18th century, for instance, there was a priest, teacher, and doctor. So they were the key drivers uh, of the given culture. And very often it was just one and sole person. But this does not exist uh, currently uh, here, and uh, remuneration uh, fails as well. Even though we hear that it is necessary to approach this uh, in this way, but uh, when it comes to the education, if you think about how teachers talk to you at school, um, did they talk about, universe, uh, about uh, the European Union? Yeah, for instance, uh, I started my universal university studies when we acceded to the EU. Uh, did you think that the teacher is also just involved uh, in thinking about it or before you started to study um, uh, elsewhere? Uh, frankly speaking, so when I was uh, at school, so there was not a mention there of the EU. So I still study at the higher school, but I don't remember a specific lesson where we would discuss this. Uh, then the, I attended a, a law seminar. There were some mentions there about the EU, but uh, that would be all. Uh, that's rather sad. Well, I remember one or two lessons uh, devoted to the international institutions uh, and the uh, the lesson of European Union was uh, the most boring uh, lessons, uh, just uh, a list of various figures and data. Perhaps it depended on the teacher, but um, it was uh, not attractive. Uh, and perhaps it is like this uh, still today, uh, just uh, mere data are rather boring. Uh, and uh, we didn't receive more information about why we exceeded, why, uh, what were the reasons of becoming a member, etc. If I may add, uh, maybe I may be a devil's advocate because my experience is totally different. Uh, uh, even though we, we didn't discuss the European Union, maybe due to the fact that I was there in the 60s. Recently, there was a parents' meeting uh, at a grammar school where my, that my daughter attends. Uh, and um, usually it's not a very happy event uh, for the parents. But when I entered that building, 
uh, I realized that uh, the whole previous week was devoted to the European Union. It's a grammar school of uh, uh, German Knights uh, in the town of Olomouc. And what I want to say is that I entered the classroom and um, so my my girl, my daughter attends the seventh grade, and uh, there was an inscription or the sign on the door: Euro- "The European Union is sexy," and it was just great. What a slogan! We just discussed it with the teacher, and in the end of the day, everybody was happy about it. So it, it depends, you see. It depends what type of school you are in or what type of teacher you have. Uh, education and motivation of the teacher, yeah. If we get back to values, European values, uh, human values, uh, uh, or other type of values, uh, what uh, you prefer, or how would you approach it? A year ago, approximately, during the Trump campaign, make American America great again, this top sort of slogan, Well, I just changed it, and I started to send made it too sexy slogan. I sent it to all my friends, made, make it too sexy again. Well, it is very difficult to explain it, but uh, if someone speaks truth or tries to seek it, it should be okay. Uh, So a certain dialogue may be formed. And make it sexy, that's important. And, uh, well, let me use this picture of this this gentleman because he was very wise. Well, I would opt for the truth, seeking the truth. That's a value for me, more than anything else, even the European value. Well, that's a question from the audience. Uh, A value that brings the continent together. There may be a certain historical uh, experience from the war, uh, but we didn't live it. Um, We lived in totality or something about the love that may be seen as something uh, common. I'm not that old, says the other speaker. But you started it. I said that I am not a millennial. It doesn't mean that uh, I was born during the World War II. Sorry. For, I'm a bit afraid that uh, for many people this starts to be something uh, a matter of course. But uh, you see, there are certain positives uh, that are being lost. Uh, but if we want to have certain values, so they they should remain in the society, in the relationship amongst the people, something that is currently being slightly lost. It's a hugely political debate, sorry. One of the basic values, uh, especially for the Czech people, that they should take to their hearts uh, is the courage. Because in the past, we used to be a nation that after the World War II um, let others to guide it. Perhaps uh, uh, we have to bear the consequences that we uh, voted for the communists. uh, And currently, this may be the reason for the rise of uh, extremist parties or movements. Uh, They are more present than in the past. People should become more courageous, bolder, and uh, be interested in the present situation, be on their own and not let somebody else guide them. To have to be, uh, to have courage, not to be afraid. Uh, yes, that's very important, Mr. Miller. Do you think that, uh, uh, as this country, this uh, nation has been determined as well as uh, limited by something, 
uh, isn't it true what Bara said, uh, that uh, we are afraid to be responsible, to be courageous? Uh, is it worse in this uh, country than elsewhere? Uh, France, Germany, they will decide everything, so I don't care. I don't know whether or not I understood your question. I ask you whether the courage is lacking because of the of our past. For me, courage is of key importance uh, in connection with the concept uh, from the previous palace, namely uh, the civic society. So the civic society is based on a courage. Uh, if someone uh, is uh, courageous to uh, present uh, their own opinions uh, with proper arguments, uh, uh, well, is uh, someone who is able to form, to form a civic society. Each authority, each authoritarian regime is based on fear um, that uh, uh, when uh, the society gives up uh, fear and becomes courageous, uh, then it results uh, in the creation of a civic society. I don't know whether my colleagues here um, agree with me, but I feel that uh, in the present Czech Republic something positive is happening. And I have a strong feeling that the civic societies, society is really waking up. Uh, and I also feel that people are just finding their courage, courage to express their opinion, oppose things uh, that they don't like. Uh, and it's true, especially about the young people that I meet uh, every day. I am a great optimist. Uh, I hope that uh, it's okay. What about uh, the other speakers? Uh, I totally agree with this opinion because I also feel that uh, something is in motion, so to say. For instance, the fact that uh, in France 100,000 people come into streets while here only 10,000 in the Czech Republic, so that's just uh, in proportion. Well, I wouldn't be afraid. But, sorry, I have to see, say another but. It requires a lot of small work. You have to go to pubs and whenever I have a concert in the country. So I say such things after the concert. Every small thing pays. Uh, you should go to the village, to the town, sh look around, and this is the basis for f shaping a certain relationship. Well, I like to travel across the country as well to abroad, and uh, it is it is great for me if I can meet young people. And for instance, uh, the secondary schools, uh, high schools, I usually take away a lot of uh, courage and positive uh, strengths uh, from the young people. And I have to say that this present young generation is uh, very much different uh, from the generation that holds currently power. Obviously, each and every young generation is different uh, from various reasons. Um, one of them uh, may be the social network, uh, um, internet. The present young people are closer to the world happenings. And I'm a great optimist, uh, and I do agree what has been said, uh, namely that uh, building of civic society is never-ending. Uh, it's a never-ending story and work. Well, another question, rather technical in its nature. Uh, what may influence uh, the outcome of the elections? Uh, would you be in favor of the uh, age uh, uh, for elections changes from 18 to 16. When I was 16 or 17, now I'm 19 only, that's not a big difference, but in those days uh, it was different. 
And this is why uh, the limit or the, the, the dividing line is as it is now. When I think about it, uh, I would say that uh, back when I was 16, I thought how adult I am, but still, now I see how much uh, someone else could uh, influence me. And that's why I would keep this uh, election age uh, entitlement uh, for the 18 years of age. On the other hand, I think that the majority of people uh, could be negatively affected in a younger age of, of 16. I agree. I remember that uh, when I was 16, uh, 17, I was a uh, very different person when I was uh, 18. So my view of the world was uh, changing. Obviously, it's not only about the age, but... Uh, and I can see it in schools. Uh, a number of 15-year-olds or 16-year-olds uh, uh, have much more critical approach to matters than those who are 60, depending, depending this on teachers, on their teachers. Under no circumstances. If I remember what I did at the age of 16, well, that would be a disaster had I uh, had the opportunity of influencing the decisions. I would even, you know, perhaps uh, uh, increase the uh, age uh, limit or, and perhaps the top one I would bring down. I, I don't know. Well, and also the... Uh, I'm also against this uh, GCE or maturita exam to be, uh, you know, at the age of 18, uh, one eight. Well, perhaps, yeah, to, you should say for the General Certificate of Education at the age of 60, yeah, because uh, it's a life, you know, which makes, uh, gives you knowledge. I'm surprised because I'm an old man. I should be conservative, and I can very well imagine these 16-year-old boys and girls uh, are having the right to vote. And I would perhaps be looking forward to the outcome. Are you curious or inquisitive that do that? Degree? Well, I've been surrounded surrounded by young people all my life. And I'm such an idealist. I believe I can trust them. And maybe, I don't know, but to be quite frank, to be quite frank, my, it, this is not the number one priority to bring down the age uh, at the age of 16. But I would only give uh, the right to vote to women. Ah, well, I know many men who would uh, take it away from us, you know. Since I'm looking forward to the era where women dominate or what, but this is perhaps not the topic of our today's uh, discussion or dialogue. Thank you. I believe we are just uh, sort of getting close to the end of this debate, or we are just about to wrap up, and that is why I wonder what is the Europe, not only EU, which you would uh, dream of or which you would like to have. I mean, Barbara, women first. Well, that's a question which corresponds with the essay that I wrote, uh, the topic of which uh, was what republic do you dream about, or what's the kind of republic you dream about. I picked four countries which I thought uh, were uh, worth drawing inspiration from, I mean, which we could uh, draw lessons from, and uh, I think we should simply um, throw off these stereotypes of uh, bad mood, um, frustration, socks and sandals wearing, and think more about uh, the good things we can take or we can uh, so to say, take from the or take over from other countries. I believe that Czech Republic in the Union has a major potential. And 
if people know, if the man in the street knows more about this potential, he, she will be more happy or satisfied, and that will have a good impact on the functioning of the union. This is just like a mind-numbing phrase from the billboard. More self-confident, uh, Czech Republic internally self-confident. We shouldn't believe that we have no say and we don't influence anything, and then we only complain post-factor uh, instead of simply trying to influence things. Um, I remember an interview with Jean-Claude Juncker who talked about the move uh, transport between Paris and Luxembourg of the uh, European Union. He said history is simply expensive, prohibitive. I thought this was a bit too cheeky or um, uh, arrogant, you know. So we shouldn't believe that all the designs or all the way things are set out are not prohibitive set out we shouldn't be we shouldn't take it as for granted How about you well if we want uh, borderless Europe then we have to bring down the borders uh, barriers in ourselves inherently oh, I've always been trying to uh, believe uh, there are no limits. So we have to start, uh, each and every one has to start with him, herself, back at home, in peace, relaxed. Uh, we have to get rid of the limits or borders and then that will be it. I don't dare to predict anything. Well, it may be a dream, just a dream. Share with us your dream. Well, Two factors will decide about uh, the future, which are contradictory as a matter of fact. There are things which force Europe to get more united. These are geopolitical factors which will enable Europe to resist such a world powers, great powers as China or Russia. So a certain degree of unity will be a must. Now, on the other hand, though, Europe in its history as always could have thanked, uh, uh, I mean, its diversity for the welfare and well-being competition. And these are factors which actually support Support uh, diversity. So these are two questions, or the two questions that will have to be solved, brought into balance, and then they will decide about the future of Europe in 10 or 15 years' time because it's a huge ship and it's a tanker, oil tanker-like, you know, vehicle. And if you move the steering, uh, there is inertia. And I have no single or clear idea about uh, the future of Europe in 15 years' time. Perhaps it will all depend uh, on the others. Well, I wish you a happy end. Of, of the future Europe or to the future Europe. Thank you for being here with us. Barbara uh, Wojciech Dick, Barbara Kularwa, Jaroslav Milarkovi. That's it. Thank you. Thank you all for your attention and enjoy the rest of the afternoon or early evening. Thank you. So, uh, well, uh, selfie. They we should make or uh, take a picture together, a group photo, family photo. Who is gonna take the photo? I don't know. I wish us to be there together with the audience, so everyone should be in the picture. Now. Now I know how to do that. I saw that on the occasion of my concert, how to fit in everyone in the frame. Lovely. Could you send it to my daughter, please, I mean, That will be a proof of me meeting you, and she admires you. Well, this is it. Thank you, Susanna Tvarushkova, for excellent um, moderation or an excellent last panel, panel three. And now, ladies and gentlemen, 
that's we are in the finishing stride, so to say. I wish to thank you for listening to all our deliberations and uh, simple discussions about whether or not uh, the EU is a matter of love or marriage of convenience whether the uh, Europe, Central Europe uh, uh, is to be in the EU and the EU in the Central Europe. And uh, the last panel, what will the millennials uh, do with the future of Europe? At a certain point of time, I was afraid of very bleak uh, considerations or contemplations. And very smart or intelligent people uh, said that uh, during the era of social networks, works and transnational uh, companies. It doesn't really make sense to have kids, to have children, that there are no permanent values in place, that values keep changing. And I simply believe it's my duty uh, in the name of human, uh, of um, Václav Havel, to express our belief uh, that, uh, or my belief, that permanent values do prevail and exist. And we heard that in the last panel, hope, courage, life as basic values, truth, or the truth, and perhaps love as well. So I'm happy we heard it all. And uh, we heard it, uh, I mean, articulated by young people. We shall now continue with a cultural program for young people, I believe. Um, prior to the Velvet Revolution, we had a dreadful slogan on the state of the society that was bare sausages and hatred. We have slightly changed that, and now we call it beer, sausages, and tolerance. That's uh, what we will have, and that's a party thrown for all of you, our guests. At the same time, we shall listen to the uh, Odd Gifts band, music band. So, Odd Gifts. But... Prior to that, uh, to conclude the conference, we shall listen to the youngest Minister of Foreign Affairs and the History of the Czech Republic, Mr. Patry Czech. Good evening. I feel happy and privileged to be the last speaker who is to deliver closing remarks. First and foremost, I'm very grateful uh, for this uh, debate or dialogue uh, on the occasion of the uh, highlight or uh, major anniversary of our new era history. I'm also happy the organizers um, invited a broad variety of uh, guests uh, from different walks of life. And it's thanks to them that the debate uh, brought about new things. I would also appreciate meeting some uh, other people on the occasion of conferences and politicians only, because we tend to keep repeating the same phrases. And being an almost, uh, so to say, member of the millennials, I feel we, or our experience, differs a lot from the experience of the others. Since we are in a place where the legacy of Havel is mentioned, we would like to read a, sorry, a quotation that Václav Havel wrote in 90, or said in 1994. I don't consider the European Union to be a monstrous silver state, a super state, where all the varied parts, nation, nations, cultures, regions, ethnic should be dissolved. On the very contrary, I take it as a consistent formation of a space that will enable different autonomous units to, or entities to further develop in the safe environment of Europe based on the democratic principles, rule of law, open market economy. 
I guess that these very words reflect or uh, show why we wanted to join the or accede to the EU and why it ha happened in 2004. We became members of the family of uh, European nations or member states uh, who share the very same set of values. And now, after those uh, 15, one, five years, we have to keep Beating and remembering that the EU is not about uh, a set number of uh, kilometers of roads built, but the fact that we are present and involved in, a, un, in an unparalleled project, and that we believe simply in the same things, values, and in the diversity that we live in, like us in Czechia liking sandals and socks and not understanding why in Italy they don't wear socks, that in this diversity we can identify unity. And we have learned to settle the disputes uh, and differences uh, by chats uh, over or sitting around one single table while maintaining our uh, sovereignty. Over those 15 years, so the membership is pretty young, still pretty fresh. And I talked uh, the other day with the millennials or my uh, peers that uh, we've been uh, experiencing membership puberty. And we now talked about the potential age of 16 as the age limit for the right to vote. But uh, after those... First up, after those 15 years, we realize it's not about them or us. It's about our common or joint EU. And I would love to uh, experience or live uh, to hear we have been doing things in Europe together that the Brussels is the place or venue of our um, simply co-decision making on our future fate or destiny and it is our uh, ambitious task to take care of it and uh, help it prosper. Perhaps since one of the blogs uh, focused on Central Europe or one of the panels uh, focused on Central Europe uh, this is. Um, I'm not. Uh, do not stick to my speech or address, which had been written for me. But still, I like the idea written here. Milan Kundera, one of those uh, famous or well-known uh, writers, thought about uh, Central Europe or. Uh, in, uh, in one of his books, he talked about what Central Europe means uh, to, uh, to Czechs, Poles, Hungarians, and he concluded that all these nations have always been part and parcel of Europe and share the Christian values, and they had been present in all these stages of development. We have been an integral part of the strong civilization space of Europe. So we have only come back uh, to the place we have always belonged to. And uh, now, I don't think we should think about not belonging to this space any longer, because in the past, Central Europe or Central and Eastern Europe has always prospered whenever we manage to cooperate at those points of time. When we fail to do that, we were not doing well. And I would not change anything. And since I'm a father, I would not change the shape or orientation of uh, EU either because I want my kids uh, to be Europeans, to be the Europeans who will have a say in uh, Europe and will contribute to the future of the European Union and will uh, support uh, the values of, or, or, or will respect, again, rule of law, uh, truth, etc., and respect for human rights without which Europe would not be the same.
this is what our generation leaves as a legacy to our children and the future generations in channel. Regardless of the fact that uh, we have now been talking about the challenges or issues uh, encountered by Euro, because it's not about debit credit only, it's not about benefits or contributions and how much money we get from the EU because, you know, by having learned to cooperate we have become far more stronger and powerful as against us being all alone as Czechs, Slovenians, Poles, Hungarians and all the others. Since it's only through the cooperation that Europe may cope and manage and can up keep all the gains and achievements which uh, we fail to um, recognize or appreciate in our everyday lives. And life in Europe is suddenly worth fighting for, not only in the political arena, but across uh, the walks of life. And it does prove that Europe is an area or space where people from elsewhere wish to come and to move. The fact that people, I oftentimes say that people, um, so to say, vote by means of their legs. Uh, and by that, I mean that people move to a country where they would like to bring up their children. So we should enjoy living in Europe. EU is a project we shall not be ashamed for and uh, a project that we should uh, fight uh, for verbally in particular. I also liked in this uh, debate that you have to be courageous enough to stand up to what you believe in and be ready to be slapped when you tell the truth in a pub. And and now I wish to call upon all of you to not to be afraid to be spanked and slapped and uh, get out of your social bubbles and let us uh, start building uh, a new society that uh, rests on the, the respected values. Lack of unity is exactly the thing that puts at the major risk or jeopardy, not only Czech Republic, but Europe uh, as a whole. Therefore, all the dividing line which still uh, prevail, we should uh, try to overcome or erase without, of course, uh, giving up our diversity. And I believe that the motto we uh, heard that in diversity we may get unity is uh, a typical description of what we have been working for over the last 15 years. Uh, and I guess we will work on it even once we become of age uh, in terms of our membership. We can be proud of what we have achieved. We are certain helpful in Europe and we do belong to Europe. Europe uh, for sure. Děkuji panu ministru Petříčkovi. Well, let us thank uh, our foreign minister, Mr. Petříček. And uh, as for the last two or three minutes, I would say that uh, we should add uh, the value of decency. And therefore, in this very moment, we should all it's extend our thanks to those invisible people without whom this very conference and dialogues wouldn't be possible. So first of all, technical staff uh, of uh, the uh, Center of Modern Art docs. Our interpreters um, uh, who have been working uh, hard uh, for the whole day translating from English and Czech and vice versa. And finally, to all my colleagues from the Václav Havel Library who organized this very event, perhaps without me. Thank you very much.